Okay, let's go from there to Patek Philippe, right? Patek is an interesting one also because a lot of their watches are sold through the retail channel as well. I believe it's 85% of their watches are True. being, right? Yeah. So uh, we're looking at a top line figure of 2.05 billion, but we're looking at a retail figure of 2.7 billion as well, which also uh, leads me to believe that their marginality is around 30% as well. But again, any Patek or Rolex retailer giving this kind of margin in the world is not complaining at all because those watches, again, they come in the door and they're just being given to the person that you like best. Tell me about your reflections on Patek Philippe, sir. Patek is just a league on its own, like Rolex is uh, on the sport chic. Patek is overall, it's the Rolls Royce of, of uh, watchmaking. Even, even if you don't like Rolls Royce, it stands for something. So does uh, Patek. They still have a lot of potential, I think so, to, to capture, as you rightfully said, uh, some more margin and some more top line. I think they will do so, definitely. They will, they are very close to, to Rolex. They talk to each other. If Rolex starts buying Boucherer and verticalizing, so will uh, Patek in the near future. I'm very much convinced. That's that really interesting. So I want to pause for a second to talk a little bit about uh, Thierry Stern's leadership, you know, because everyone looks at his dad, Philippe Stern, as being a genius of the watch industry, and he absolutely is, right? He was the guy who created the Patek Museum. He was the guy who like drove the, the rebirth of Grand Complications with the Caliber 89. You know, he was an absolute genius. He also made the manufacturing at Plan Le Watt. But I think Thierry Stern has come into his own as a remarkable and incredibly successful leader in his own right as well, right? And I, I have to yeah. really applaud Thierry Stern also for while retaining all the codes of Patek, making it a lot more connected to the world of today. Like, you you know, I, people sometimes are like, oh, but I don't like the fact that this modern person or that musician or that NBA star or whoever is wearing a Patek. I'm like, guys, that's ridiculous. You're, then you're, you might as well say that watches shouldn't be connected to contemporary culture at all. And I love the idea that Patek is now a brand that everyone in the world and the most contemporary or people in the world, people like me who are maybe have tattoos or whatever like that, they have come to the realization that this brand is the king of complications. And when it comes to the most refined Swiss watch in the world, you're not gonna get anything better than Patek. Would you agree, sir? I agree with, with everything you just said. There are other extraordinary watches and, and brands, but Patek really is in, a, in its own league. And, and that's a very important aspect that you're bringing up. Uh, the, the capacity of connecting with the new generations, the capacity of being seen on, on the wrists of, of stars, etc. And let's not forget, they are not paying anyone to wear their watches. They don't have a single brand ambassador, not a single one. That's very unique. No other brand, at least to my best knowledge, can pretend that they have no one. But you are seeing the boxers, the, the baseball players, the basketball players, etc. The actors, uh, moguls uh, in the in the. Uh, movie industry, etc. They are all wearing at least one uh, Patek. That's, of course, that's very unique. Of that's, course, that's an endorsement which is worth a fortune. Absolutely, and and you know, for me, uh, like I love, of course, like all the traditionalists out there, the campaign that you know you never really own a Patek, but you keep it for the next generation. But if you love that, then you will have to also embrace the next generation. You have to endorse the generation for the language of their style, the way they like to live their lives, the way they like to present themselves to the world. I'm sorry, these are not the type of guys anymore who are going to wear a coat and tie the breakfast. But their appreciation for Patek can have the same sincerity, the same refinement, and the same sense of authenticity. And and I think that's what we have today. And I would give uh, kudos to Mr. Thierry Stern for having the courage of uh, phasing out the 5711 Nautilus, which was just basically the dream watch of, of thousands of people. The waiting list when they, when they announced that they would uh, discontinue it was 12 years. So that gives you an idea of how much sought after that watch was. And all of a sudden, the boss comes and says, no, no, we stopped that for this and that reason. <laughs> I found that extraordinary intelligent move, a bold move. Let's imagine someone at a listed company group would do that. He would get fired the, the next <laughs> second, probably. So bravo, Mr. Stern. And to come with a successor, the 5811, which they initially 
offered just in precious metal, which I love as well. We'll see if there's a steel one that happens uh, during Watches and Wonders. Uh, but a more refined, more elegant watch, slightly slimmer, two-piece case instead of three-piece case, yeah. and a constant evolution towards better quality. Now, you said something really uh, interesting to me as well. We looked at the top line figure of Audemars Piguet, yeah. right? Now, to be honest, if Terry Stern wanted to, right, if he were to increase Nautilus production times 300%, he would still sell all of those watches. Of course. And he would immediately leapfrog a whole bunch of other brands and probably land himself in the second position on this list as well. He has just consciously decided not to, right? Yes. And that takes incredible foresight. It takes incredible discipline. This takes really a person who doesn't care about today or doesn't care about the short-term results, but is creating immortality for his brand, right? He's, he, he's, he's envisioning what his brand wants. He wants his brand to be in the long term, and he doesn't want his brand to be a mono product brand. He wants Paddock to be revered for complications, for classic watches, for sports watches, for women's watches, for everything, and he's done an incredibly successful job. But at the same time, from time to time, he has fun. Uh, and one of those uh, examples for me was the Aquanaut gem set minute repeater that he launched last year. And everyone was like, oh, but how could you put him in repeater in an aquanaut case and not make Why it not? waterproof it's like dude we're, if you're in a position to buy that watch you're not going swimming with it anyway right the most it might get wet from a champagne shower but that's about it right so anyway right? i always like it when people critique things that they'll never be in a position to own but anyway sure. that's a different thing okay let's talk about one of the great success stories of last year, and that is Vacheron Constantin. Yeah. Wow, so I love this. Vacheron has passed the 1 billion Swiss franc threshold. It was cool because last year I saw um, the CEO, Louis Furla, uh, in Dubai, uh, and he explained to me that that he had done this, that they, have, had they as, as a brand had achieved this. But he said to me, Wei, that was not the objective, right? Success ultimately is just the byproduct of a job well done. Right? And what he's been doing in particular is uplifting Vacheron in an incredible way. Right, If you think about it 10 years ago, Vacheron was really respected, really revered. It's one of the uh, holy trinity of high watchmaking, but it wasn't relevant. It wasn't dynamic. It wasn't modern. Today, some of the uh, Vacheron watches are even more modern than their competitors, right? Yes. Like you saw Brad Pitt wearing a 222 uh, during one of the F1 races. We see so many cool people now wearing Vacherons. Uh, the Vacheron Constantine entire overseas collection is amazing, but at the same time, they're killing it in the historiques, right? The uh, Corne de Vache is incredible. The 1941 is incredible as well, right? They're killing killing it on the complications, they're killing it on the metier de art. So like every single pillar of Vacheron is being uplifted. And I think that's the magic of what Louis Furla has done. How do you feel about Vacheron? Vacheron, you, you have again summarized uh, a lot of, of the positive aspects of the brand. Of course, they took advantage of, of the scarcity of the sports chic stainless steel watches like the 5711, the Royal Oak, etc. And on, the, on that track, uh, we have the overseas overperforming and 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 really helping the brand to to grow even more. My, when I saw the first time the overseas when it was launched, thought, "Wow, that's a nice watch. That's really cool. It's it's a design on its own. It's not just a." Uh, we shouldn't use that word, but it's not a, a Me Too, Nautilus, or Royal Oak. It's it's a design on its own and, and very nicely done. And the success came later on, as, as we know. So um, they took advantage of that. But apart from that, yes, definitely, they do an extraordinary job. Um, where the the market is still not paying the right price for what the what the brand would deserve is on the secondary market where we are still seeing the prices not up where they should be especially compared with the main competitor Patek Philippe it will take time everything takes time for a luxury brand Mr Ferla and his team are doing just an outstanding job um, as you rightfully said, uh, métier d'art, etc. So, yes, kudos. When I go and hang out there, well, I also love the fact that the, the team is so incredibly motivated as well, and they see that too. Um, I agree with you that, okay, maybe the secondary pricing is not at the same level as, let's say, a paddock or an AP, but I, you know, I asked him this question as well, and he said, but that's, you know, it's not something we actively get involved in. The market will eventually catch up with the desire of the watches. The other thing that's important too is that during the period, the, the crazy kind of like, you know, uh, hype uh, watch years that we just went through, 
There were so many people that just by uh, jumping into the integrated bracelet sports sheet category had a success, right? Yes. Now we're in a different period, right? I think when uh, Warren Buffett likes to say, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked, right? <laughs> and now we're going to see who's swimming naked because now times are tough. There's a lot of brands who jumped in there. Um, some of them will remain. Like I think, for example, the show Power Alpine Eagle is a great watch and I think it will remain. Some of them are starting to fall off a cliff already, right? Yes. And you see it. The overseas will stay in terms of its desirability. First, because it's got an incredible patrimony and authenticity. Second of all, because it's genuinely a phenomenal watch. And I think the overseas perpetual calendar is possibly the sexiest integrated bracelet perpetual calendar watch that I can think of. And I own its competitor, right? Um, I don't have one of those yet, but you know, maybe one day. So, <laughs> so, so okay, let's uh, go maybe to one of the surprises in your report, which was François Paul Jorn. Right? Yep. Also, Paul Jorn is uh, close to 100 million, right? Yes. Uh, and he is actually making 1,800 watches a year. Yes. Which is actually, took. I think it's a figure that took a lot of people by surprise, but I think you had an explanation for that. Please tell me. Yes, the explanation is that he does a lot of elegant, that very, very smart uh, uh, product, which is a uh, quartz watch for women at an accessible price, and you still get the Francois Paul Journe. So uh, that has a, a huge success, and that's about six, seven hundred pieces on its own. So the rest are mechanical uh, watches. It's kind of, if, if I may uh, make a, a confidence, uh, it's one of my most loved brands overall. The I product. love François Paul Journe. For, from and he's the a beginning. genius. He's a genius. From the beginning. Yes. yes. So I would say, you know, for me, François Paul Journe is, is one of the most extraordinary brands because he's a true authentic watchmaker that has written his legacy in such a smart way with these iconic complications and managed his brand so intelligently as well. Yes. When I see that figure, I'm not upset by it at all because, and I'll tell you why, and it, I, you know, again, I don't have the information that you have, but it's say he's making six or 700 elegance a year, which I love the fact that he made a quartz watch. I remember when he's telling me his idea, he said, I want to make the most intelligent quartz watch ever. And I love the fact that, you know, put it down and if you yeah. don't wear it, it goes to sleep. And then you pick it back up, it goes back to where it needs to be yeah. right but the fact is and it's that it's always for, on time it's always on time but uh, for those 700 watches that are being made there are 7,000 people that want to buy them right the, and you look at the secondary market of elegance you look at how hard it is to get an elegant everybody wants that watch so brilliant watch as well and, and probably from a margin perspective a very brilliant watch also right so it goes to show you that he is a very smart businessman incidentally this was kind of the model at one point that Paddock had also with the 24 as well, right? Yes. Where they produced a 24, it was a quartz watch, but it was a brilliant watch, you know? So uh, no disrespect whatsoever. I think it's an incredible achievement and it doesn't make me want an elegant even less. It makes probably makes me want it more sure. <laughs> actually, yeah. you know? Uh, and again, and nothing but the greatest respect for François Paul Jorn. So let's talk about some overview for, you know, you mentioned right in the beginning of our conversation that like the industry now is kind of divided into the strongest players, right? And I think you'd mentioned uh, Audemars Piguet, Patek Philippe, Rolex, uh, and Richard Mille, yes. right? And which are all- The big four. The big four independent ones, right? Yeah. Because we've excluded uh, uh, Cartier and Omega, which are part of groups, yes. right? And these guys are have an incredible market share of the industry. I mean, yep. tell me about that. It's uh, it's now almost up to forty four percent market shares divided on only four brands. Wow! And the thing is, that's the magic rule. Once you are in the positive momentum, then you you keep. It's a virtuous circle where your profitability grows even faster than your top line. So that's the extraordinary thing about it. And uh, they are privately owned. So that's probably also making a little bit of difference when you think long term rather than the next quarter. I shouldn't say this because I'm working, I'm, I'm very privileged to work with Morgan Stanley, a bank uh, which analyzes the market. But uh, it's fair to say that those four champions are privately owned by families or a trust like uh, for Rolex and they have all the time needed. Like uh, that's another CEO of Hermes once said, we have the eternity in front of us so we don't need to rush into anything and and that's that's I think one part of the success yes actually it's nice that you mentioned Hermes and Laurent Daudet has done an incredible job with that brand as yes. well it's nice to see them like actually place quite uh, well in this list also because they've made such an effort over the years to really go into watchmaking with incredible integrity tell me about Hermes Hermes is incredible I, I would start with this 
The, their success is so intriguing because they went from an accessory, like they were about 20 years ago, doing huge volumes, being sold at quite low prices with a lot of quartz, etc. And then they geared up the game and said, OK, we are Hermes, we can't have a product category which is totally misaligned with the rest of the brand because we know Hermes for the bags uh, you, you took before the Birkin or whatever, the Cali bag, which is the quint essentially, the, the bag that someone, a woman, not me, uh, no, I shouldn't say this, that's old <laughs> style. Uh, would Actually, there's a lot of guys wearing Birkin bags now. Yeah, apparently, well, apparently. There's nothing yeah, wrong yeah, about yeah, that. Exactly. Um, so, uh, yes, they, they, they decided to, to gear up and they cleaned a lot their collection. They are very focused on, the, on bringing that collection even more so. I, st I, think, I still think there is some room uh, for improvement there, but, but so far they have done an extraordinary job. Lifted up everything with mechanical movements. They bought into the Vaucher manufacturer to get access to those mechanical movements. And then what they even achieved is that as of today, they are selling minute repeaters, tourbillons. Métier d'art, you know. Métier d'art. Phenomenal. In quite substantial quantities, yeah. and that lifts up also the, the whole brand. The whole brand is being brought to another level, which allows the rest of the brand also to be perceived as something serious. And we are seeing the last few years that the, the growth rates that they are achieving are just magic. All right, buddy, then if we're gonna talk about Hermes, then let's talk a little bit about Louis Vuitton, right? Because I think what Jean Arnaud has done is incredible. You know, honestly, uh, if you asked me three, four years ago, will Vuitton ever be a serious contender in high watchmaking, I would just be like, no, right? But what Jean has done in two and a half years has been simply extraordinary. You know, first, he's completely changed the perception of Vuitton uh, by getting rid of its bestseller, the tambour, and replacing it with an all new tambour that from every dimension is a phenomenal watch, right? It's an integrated bracelet watch with no bezel, right? With no lugs, it's a completely original design with incredible integrity in terms of the manufacturing of its dial, its bracelet, and its uh, Cirque du Allegra movement. You put it on your wrist, you just fall in love with it. And I know, it's a great watch because I ordered one and I have to pay full price for it. And you know, as a journalist, I'm a really cheap guy, you know, but I still love this watch. Then he uplifted Vuitton even more through Le Fabrique Vuitton with the rebirth of Daniel Roth and Gerald Genta. Then on top of that, he's done these incredible collaborations with independent watchmakers like Regzep Regzepi because he loves independent watchmaking and wants to give something to this culture. And I can tell you right now, his plan is not just to make cool watches, but in 2025, he will write a new chapter in the history of watchmaking with an incredible watchmaker and so it's really ambitious what he wants to do. Yes. And earlier this year, he did the Louis Vuitton watch prize for independent creatives. And that was really cool as well because he's identifying the next generation of talent and uplifting them through Vuitton. So I have to say Vuitton now is okay, not really a big player, but it has potential. Would you agree, sir? It has a lot of potential. And the interesting thing, that's why you brought up Louis Vuitton just right after Hermès, is that they're basically applying uh, the same strategy. They have seen at Hermès that it works perfectly well with a lot of success. And at Louis Vuitton, they said, okay, let's do the, the same thing. When I said that the first time to Jean, and that shows that he's a very smart, besides being intelligent, he's and nice. And he's nice. And he's nice. He's very humble. Yes. Uh, and he's a nice guy. And he's passionate about watches. But this guy. He's passionate about the product, yes. which not so many CEOs are, if I may. I totally agree. Uh, he's really passionate about what he's doing. And, and when I told him, but basically you're applying the same strategy as Hermes, he said, yes, that's, that's the thing. The difference is. At Louis Vuitton, they are even bolder because they cleaned out almost all the quartz, not, not all, but almost. They cleaned out the entry-level industrial movement. They are moving up, they are gearing up. And I think the two of us, when we saw the first time the new tambour in April, uh, when, they, when they launched it to their own staff, I was full of praise because the design, it's, it already it's an icon. 
but the the designer uh, managed to to even increase further uh, the design codes of a, of a base design. I think, and and no offense to the designer who did the first tambour, because I know him, and I probably you're still my friend. <laughs> um, the new one is a lot more refined. It's so is the movement. Um, it's a bold move, huh? you, you, you go up with a three-hander at 90,500 euros, uh, 90,000 Swiss, that's quite bold, but, but I am 100% sure they will succeed, lift up the game, it takes time, yes. but they have all the time, all the money, all the power, and then there is Jean with his smartness, he's nice, he's smart. Um, he has those two extraordinary watchmakers at La Fabrique du Temps, uh, Michel Navas and Enrico Barbazzini, yeah. uh, who used to be my partners at Laurent Ferrier. <laughs> Hello, Laurent Ferrier. <laughs> uh, so they have everything it takes to succeed. But they do it in a very nice manner. Yes. They are not over aggressive, they are not arrogant. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that a lot. I, I totally agree. And, and you make a really, really good point. Jean has a huge knowledge and passion for watches. And you're right, not every CEO today does, right? No. Okay, so let's end this with maybe a controversial moment where we're going to ask Oliver what he would potentially value companies at. What, what I would value companies at? Yes. So, w which one? Let's start with Rolex. <laughs> 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 15.1 billion at Ooh. the retail level. Ooh. Right. I would dare to say that the, the brands, I mean, let's start it this way. There is a very conventional way of, of, of uh, putting a value on a, on a company and even more so on a brand. So it's a multiple of the sales or it's a multiple of the EBIT, the uh, a gross margin, uh, the operational gross margin. Okay, so that's one way to do it. The other way, you look at a brand like Ferrari. Uh, Ferrari, when you look the valuation of today, like 42 times earnings, I mean, uh, you look at the, at, at the title, you say they are crazy. No, they are not. Because you will it's, never get another Ferrari. And yeah. it's an icon. Yes. It's an you icon. Just the word Ferrari means something to so many people. And it's a dream. It's so a dream. does Rolex. A bar. So it, just much, as much. How much is Rolex worth? I would, I would, I'll turn the question around. How much is Rolex worth if Breitling has been valued at 4.2 billion with uh, not yet achieving 1 billion turnover? Um, so I look at Rolex at 10 billion, I would say it's worth any price. Uh, I would say 50, 80, 100? I think that the amount uh, has, uh, as a mathematical figure, it has not been created yet. <laughs> no. <laughs> it probably, it's, yeah. And then there is this very unique uh, parameter uh, with verticalization because uh, Rolex is one of the very, very few brands or groups, so as to say, uh, mastering everything to produce the watch. They still work with outside suppliers on some components, luckily for them because Rolex is a very, very fair client, very good payer, etc. long-term view, um, but they have integrated a lot. So they know how to produce a watch. They are the best at marketing, branding. Everything. Okay, now Richard Mille, they do also. Ah, okay, so that's girl. the next one you I want to ask you about Richard Mille, because, because <laughs> Richard Mille today means something to so many people, right? Richard Mille, for like a uh, person that loves hip hop or rap or athletics or whatever like that, that is the dream, you know? There is, you know, and this is one of the stories I want uh, to tell this year, is that there's, from a fundamental perspective, so much authenticity that goes into that brand that sometimes people forget because it's so big as a name today. When, when you, you, know, you see people who want a dream of some crazy watch, it's that. How much would you value Richard Millet? <laughs> That's the hard, uh, the hard questions. Um, I, I would say with at least eight to 10 billion Swiss. Um, 
I, I can imagine that the profitability is very, very high. It's probably one of the most profitable luxury brands overall. And don't forget, they control 100% of their distribution as well. They so do. they get, they take all the margin themselves. They right? do. Right. They, they, they capture the, the whole margin. It's worth definitely a lot of money. If, if I were to guess, I would say at least eight, probably more than that. Yeah. But Mr. Mill and his partners, I think as of today could ask any price and and someone would would pay it's very unique it's quintessentially a luxury brand built up f from a white sheet of paper in the perfect way and and of course they shocked the people when they launched their rm001 at a crazy price someone telling mr mill but you know mr mill it's more expensive than a patek philippe tourbillon <laughs> and they said but we don't compare ourselves with patek right. so they play in their own league, right. at least eight to 10. I don't want to get in, in trouble with Terry. AP15. AP15, yes. And Patek? Oh, Patek, uh, even even more, uh, uh, let's say 15 as a, as a minimum. I think that Patek is, you know, like in, when you're in the Tour de France and they have the mountains uh, that are or category, they're out. Yes. yes. You know? Yes. And I would say Rolex and Patek are or category. Yes. You can't even put a value in them because they're just so valuable. You know? Maybe 15, maybe 20, whatever. They're all always uh, those rumors coming up that they that someone could buy it. I don't think so. And I wish uh, no one buys Patek Philippe and his face with the Stern family or someone else for the very long term. I have an idea on that, <laughs> but I hope it stays in Geneva, yes. in good it, it, private it hands. It would have to stay in Geneva in private hands. It yes. would have to. And, and, and I, I think the Stern family is a perfect guardian for that. I do, I do agree. Exactly. So guys, thank you so much for joining us. Oliver Mueller, you're a legend, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the camera crew is like, how did you guys speak for an hour and 15 minutes? But we did it, you know? We'll, we'll trim it down a bit, but, but uh, it was a pleasure. And thank you so much, brother. Appreciate thank it. Thank you for having Cheers. me. Bye. Bye.